This video is going to cover topic 5, what makes a cargo. In this video we're going to be seeing that energy makes a cargo. We're also going to be looking at vectors and scalars. So in this video we're going to be looking at energy and then we're going to go and look at scalars and vectors. So we're asking the question, what makes a car go? The very simple answer to that question is energy. Energy makes a car go. But in this video, we're going to be looking at it in a bit more detail to see exactly what energy transformations take place in a car to make it move. After that, we're going to have a look at what a scalar and a vector is and the difference between the two. So we've previously met the law of conservation of energy. In an isolated system, energy is always conserved. If we want to change the energy of the system, then we need to do work on the system or transfer heat to the system, in which case it's no longer considered isolate. So let's now look at the energy transformations that take place in a car. A typical car has a, what's called a four-stroke engine. We're going to look at exactly how that engine works and we're going to use this syringe as a model of that engine. So this syringe has a piston that will move up and down. So to start with in the engine, the intake valve opens and the car does some work on the engine so it pulls the piston down and as it pulls the piston down, an air and fuel mixture goes in through this intake valve. So the cylinder in the car is now full of air with a mixture of the fuel in it as well. What happens then is that the intake valve is shut off and the engine does more work compressing this cylinder. So we've now got a mixture of fuel and air in there which is all compressed. The car then ignites the spark plugs. So these cause a spark to take place in that mixture of fuel and air. And when that happens, the temperature increases very rapidly. And we've seen from the ideal gas law, PV is equal to NRT, that if the temperature goes up, then the volume goes up. So at that point, the gas here does work on the piston and the gas all expands and the piston moves downwards. This is the most important step in the process as this is when the fuel is actually doing work on this piston and so this is when the car actually gets the energy out of the fuel. So work is a way of transferring energy and it is equal to the force times the distance. So the gas molecules in here apply a force on the syringe and the syringe moves downwards. The force applied by the gas molecules is also downwards and so we have positive work done. We are getting energy from the fuel. So the actual car itself is then gaining energy from that fuel. So now that this is expanded, this cylinder is full of spent fuel and air. So finally, to complete the cycle, the car does a bit more work on the engine. It compresses the, the cylinder, the piston, and that releases all the spent fuel and the air out of a release valve up the top. So we're now back to where we started. It can pull in another fuel-air mixture, compress the fuel-air mixture. There's a spark. It expands rapidly, releasing energy and then finally it empties out again. So in a car, that chemical potential energy is released and that does work on the piston. The piston's attached to a rotor, which goes round and round, which is eventually attached to the axle, which makes the wheels on the car turn. So we're converting the chemical potential energy into energy of movement. So this clip shows a simulation of the Audi 1.8 litre petrol engine. So 
So you can see that it's got four of these cylinders which all work simultaneously so that two are moving down while the other two are moving up. This means that one of them is producing work which drives the shaft to compress and expand the other three cylinders. Overall, you are gaining energy from this process from the conversion of the chemical potential energy. Energy of movement has a special name. It's called kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy, the energy possessed by a moving object, can be calculated using the formula a half times mv squared, where m is the mass of the object and v is the velocity of the object. So let's do an example now where we will calculate the amount of kinetic energy possessed by an object. So the question is, our car has a mass of 1,400 kilograms. How much kinetic energy does it have if it's travelling at 60 kilometres per hour? So to answer this question, we're going to need to use the formula that the kinetic energy is equal to a half mv squared. So m is the mass in kilograms and v is the velocity in metres per second. So the first thing we're need to, going to need to do is convert this speed from 60 kilometres per hour into meters, meters per second. So 60 kilometres per hour is equal to 60 times 1,000 metres per hour. And then to get it into seconds in an hour, there's 60 times 60 seconds. So these will cancel out and we end up with 16.67 meters per second. And so this tells us that the kinetic energy is equal to a half times the mass which is 1400 times 16.67 squared and so solving that on the calculator we get 194,522. So we should only give this to two significant figures so this is about 190 thousand and the units are joules because it's an energy. The question goes on. If the car has a petrol engine with an efficiency of 25%, how much fuel does it require to reach 60 kilometers per hour given that the energy density of petrol is 36 megajoules per litre? To answer this question, we're going to need to make use of conservation of energy. So conservation of energy tells us that the initial energy is equal to the final energy. Now the final energy is in the form of kinetic energy and we've just calculated how much kinetic energy it had. It had 194,522 joules. So we should keep all the significant figures while we're doing the working and then convert it back to the two significant figures at the end. Now the initial, initially the energy is stored as the chemical potential energy. This is chemical potential energy. So the amount of fuel it needs to produce this much chemical potential energy this one's the kinetic energy, is given by the efficiency times the energy density times the volume, and that is equal to 194,522. So the efficiency is 0 0.25 as it's 25%. So a quarter of the fuel is converted into energy. And then with the energy density is 36 times 10 to the 6, because it's 36 megajoules, so this is joules per litre, times the volume, which is what we're trying to find. So now we can rearrange this. The volume is equal to 194,522 divided by 36 times 10 to the 6 times 0.25. So solving that on the calculator, we end up with 0 0.022 litres, 
which is equal to 22 millilitres. So in this example we did neglect friction. Friction actually turns out to be very important and we will be looking at it in more detail in later videos. But basically the frictional force is trying to slow the car down and the car actually has to do extra work to overcome that frictional force. So if your engine stops working, the car would actually slow down as the car lost energy doing work on the friction force. So energy is what we call a scalar. A scalar is a quantity with a magnitude but no direction. So energy can be positive or negative, but we can't say that the energy is 20 joules south. That makes absolutely no sense because energy does not have a direction. Some other examples of scalar quantities are time and speed. So speed can be calculated using the distance over the time. And if you're ever asked to calculate the speed, then you do not need to give a direction. Velocity, on the other hand, is very similar to speed, except that it's what we call a vector quantity. A vector quantity is something which has a magnitude and a direction. So if you're ever asked to calculate the velocity of an object, you need to calculate how fast it's going, but also state which direction it's going in. So other vector quantities are acceleration and displacement. So displacement is like the distance, except that distance is a scalar, so it doesn't have a direction, and displacement is a vector, so it does have a direction. Now often when we're dealing with vector quantities, it's useful to convert them into components. So if we're considering a vector which is going in the north, south, east, west type directions, it would be useful to work out how much of that vector is in the north direction and how much is in the east direction. If we're considering a vector which is vertical and horizontal, so for example if we throw a ball, then it's useful to convert it into components vertically and horizontally. So in order to convert a vector into its components, you'll need to be able to deal with the trigonometry of right angle triangles. So if you've forgotten this, it may be a good idea to revise it. I've placed a link to some revision material below this lecture. So if you have forgotten trigonometry of right angle triangles, make sure that you revise that quickly. So let's have a look at a couple of examples now. So the question is, a car travels 60 kilometers in one hour. It ends up northeast of its starting position. Part A, calculate the average velocity of the car over this interval of time. B, how far north of its starting position is it? And C, how far east of its starting position is it? So to answer this question, it's a good idea to start by drawing a diagram. So here's our diagram. The car ends up 60 kilometers northeast of its starting position. So it ends up here, and this is a distance of 60 kilometers. This is an angle of 45 degrees as it's northeast. So in part A, we're asked to calculate the average velocity. So we know that the velocity is equal to the displacement over the time. So it's travelled 60 kilometres or 60,000 metres in one hour. So that's in 60 minutes and 60 seconds. And so these 60s cancel out, we end up with 1,000 up there, and that is equal to 16.67 metres per second. Now this is its average speed, but it's asked us for the average velocity, so we should give a direction for this, and the direction is northeast. Part B wants us to find out how far north of its starting position is it. So we need to find out this height here. 
So let's call this y. So we know the size of our hypotenuse and we know y. So if we use sot couture, we have the hypotenuse and the angle, the side which is opposite the angle. So we're going to have to use sine. So we know that sine of theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So substituting in, we've got sine of 45 is equal to the opposite, which we've called y, which is what we're trying to find over the hypotenuse, which is 60 kilometers. So that tells us that y is equal to 60 kilometers times sine 45. Solving this on the calculator, we end up with 42 kilometers. And it has traveled north, so it ends up 42 kilometers north of its starting position. Now in part C, we need to find out how far east. So we need to find out this distance here. Let's call that distance x. So in this case, x is the adjacent, and we know the hypotenuse. So we'll use cos. So we know that cos theta is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which tells us that cos of 45 is equal to x over 60 kilometers. And so this tells us that x, just rearranging this, is equal to 60 kilometers times cos of 45. And solving that on the calculator, we get 42 kilometers east again. So we've answered that question now. Let's have a look at another example. So this time we're told a car travels with a velocity of 20 meters per second in a direction 30 degrees west of north. If it travels for 30 minutes, A, what total distance has it traveled? B, how far north of its starting position is it? And C, how far west of its starting position is it? So we're best off to start by drawing a diagram again. So in this case, it's traveled 30 degrees west of north. So it's traveled in this direction, and there's 30 degrees there between north and west. And we're asked, what total distance has it traveled? Well, we know that speed is equal to distance over time, which tells us that distance is equal to speed times the time. This is part A, and so the speed is 20 meters per second, and the time, we need to put the time in in seconds, so we've got 30 minutes, and so that's 30 times 60 seconds. So solving this on the calculator, we end up with 36,000 meters, which is equal to 36 kilometers. So this distance here is 36 kilometers. Let's just add it to our diagram. <coughs> <coughs> now part B says how far north of its starting position is it? Okay, so we can break this vector into components. We've got a westerly component there and a northerly component there. Let's call the northerly component Y and the westerly direction component X. And once again, we'll need to use trigonometry, so let's use sock uh, toa. Okay, so first of all, we need to find out this northerly component. Now, this is adjacent to this angle because it's right next to that angle, and we also know the hypotenuse. So we'll need to use cos. So we know that cos of theta is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. So substituting in, we've got cos of 30, that's 30, sorry, is equal to the adjacent, which we've called y, over the hypotenuse, which is 36 kilometers. So that tells us rearranging y is equal to 36 kilometers times cos of 30. And solving that on your calculator, 
you get 31 kilometers. So part C says how far west of its starting position is it. So we need to work out what this x is. So to work out x, x is opposite the angle that we know and we also know the hypotenuse. So we'll be using SOP. So we've got sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. So this tells us that sine of 30 is equal to opposite, which is our x, over 36 kilometers. And so x is equal to 36 kilometers times sine of 30. So solving that on the calculator, we end up with 18 kilometers. So as we mentioned briefly, distance is a scalar and displacement is a vector. So whenever you're asked to calculate the displacement of an object, you need to include its direction. When you're calculating the distance that an object's travelled, you can ignore that direction. So let's have a look at an example doing this because this shows you some important techniques in physics such as adding vectors head to tail and using these to calculate the resultant. Okay, so the question is, a person walks 10 metres north, then 5 metres west, then 5 metres south. Part A, calculate the total distance they have travelled. Part B, calculate their displacement from their starting position. And then part C, Comment on the relationship between distance and displacement. So to answer this question, we're best off to start by drawing a diagram again. That is often a very good way to start a physics question. So let's just identify our directions. We've got north, south, east and west. Now what we're actually going to draw is what's called a vector diagram. We're going to use arrows to represent each of these quantities. So 10 metres north, we'll represent that with this arrow here. So an arrow showing that the person's walking north. Next, the person walks 5 metres west. So we draw an arrow which is half as long as this first arrow and it's pointing towards the west. And notice how we've drawn the arrows together. This is what's called the head of this arrow because it's got the arrow point, this other end is the tail. So we joined the tail of our second vector to the head of the first vector. So we say when we add vectors, which is what we're doing here, we draw them head to tail, and that's what we mean by that expression. So next we draw the 5 metres south vector, so that's going to have the same length as this vector, but be going in the south direction. And so we draw the tail of this vector at the head of the 5 meters west vector and this is our 5 meters south vector. So this is what the vector diagram looks like. Now part A is relatively easy. Calculate the total distance that they've traveled. If we want to get the total distance we just add each of the individual distances together because distance does not include a direction. So 10 metres north and 5 metres south do not cancel each other out. So total distance is equal to 10 plus 5 plus 5, which is equal to 20 metres. Now part B, we need to calculate their displacement from their starting position. Well, on this diagram, here's their starting position and here's where they end up. So the total displacement is from here to here. So we can represent that by an arrow. Now I like to represent resultant vectors with a double arrowhead. You don't have to, but I find this useful to identify the resultant vector. So when we sum all of these vectors together, this is our resultant vector. 
So what we need to do now is work out the length of this vector. So to do this, we're actually going to have to use a little bit of geometry. That's a right angle triangle there. Now if you go 10 metres north and then 5 metres south, in total you've travelled 5 metres north. So we know that this length here is 5 metres. And we also know that they've travelled 5 metres west. So you can see that this is an isosceles triangle and it's also a right angle triangle, so a right angle isosceles triangle which looks like this, 5 metres, 5 metres, since it's right angle that's 90 degrees, it's isosceles, so these two angles in here must both be 45 degrees. To work out the length of this side, what we can use is use Pythagoras' theorem. So let's let this have length L, so the length squared is equal to 5 squared plus 5 squared, so that's 25 plus 25, which is equal to 50. And so the length is equal to the square root of 50, which when we solve that on the calculator, we end up with 7.07 .07 meters. Let's put that as 7.1 meters. These were only to one significant figure, so we could just put a seven meters if we wanted. And then what we need to do is, because we're asked for a um, displacement, we also need to give a direction. So this is north, this is west, and that's 45 degrees. So the direction in this case is northwest. Now part C, comment on the relationship between distance and displacement. Well, you can see that the distance is always going to be larger than or equal to the displacement. So distance is always greater than So if a person walked 5 metres north, then 5 metres south, they have travelled a distance of 10 metres, but their displacement, for example, would be zero. So in this video, we've seen that energy does make a car go. It's the conversion of the chemical potential energy stored in the fuel, which is released as work done on the engine and converted into kinetic energy that gets a car moving. We've also had a look at scalars, which are quantities with just a magnitude, and vectors, which have a magnitude and a direction. This is a very important concept that will be built on in future videos. In the next video, we're going to consider Newton's law of motion and also the motion of objects moving in a straight line with constant acceleration. Thanks to Sebastian Frick for filming this video and thanks to Aldi for, work, for providing the simulation of the working motor.